So with all the innovation that we've seen over the last century, uh, you might wonder, how is it that we haven't already solved cancer as well? And it turns out that there's a few really big challenges, actually several very big challenges in um, treating cancer. One of which is that the drugs that we've been able to find really lack specificity. So this means that if we're trying to target cancer cells, these drugs also go to non-cancer cells and cause all sorts of toxic side effects. Um, so that's one thing that, that we need to overcome. Another is that the cancer cells themselves evolve resistance to these drugs. So even if you find a specific drug, it doesn't necessarily keep working. And after a matter of weeks or months, um, the cells find ways to get around that. So thinking about these two issues of um, specificity and overcoming evolved resistance, it occurs to me that maybe we don't just need new drugs to treat cancer. Maybe we actually need entirely new classes of drugs. And so um, in my lab at UCSF, we work on building nanoscale devices out of DNA, such as the one um, showing here that I'll explain in a moment. Um, and I think this is novel because we usually don't think of drugs as devices. We think of them as small molecules or maybe proteins. Um, and we also don't think of them as being on the nanoscale. We actually think of them as being much smaller than, um, than what I'm showing here. So for example, here's, an, here's a small molecule drug um, that you probably all have heard of. It's called penicillin. And this really revolutionized medicine when it was introduced back uh, during World War II. And it's only 41 atoms and about a one and a half nanometers across. And it's been estimated that over the last 70 years, it's saved anywhere between 80 and 200 million lives. And so, so clearly, small molecule drugs like this one can be extremely effective and very powerful. And I think it can be instructive to look at how do small molecule drugs work? Why do they work really well in certain contexts and not in others? And then maybe that can help us understand um, how we should approach developing new cancer drugs. So what happens when you get a bacterial infection? Well, if you, if you zoomed in with a microscope and looked, you might see that some unwelcome bacteria have moved in and started to divide. And, um, this doesn't really tell us what's going on when, with the drug interaction, so we actually have to zoom in even further and look at the, like the nanometer scale. And if you, looked at the, if you could look at the surface of the cell, you could see that the bacteria actually manufacture their cell wall out of a, out of a protein called, uh, well, out of a polymer called peptidoglycan, actually. And they also, they also manufacture an enzyme that they secrete called transpeptidase. And this enzyme actually spot welds that polymer together. And this is what gives the wall its, its integrity. So it turns out that penicillin is, um, is able to bind to and interact with that transpeptidase um, really perfectly. So when we take a penicillin drug, it's, it's actually specifically targeting that transpeptidase. And if we looked at the molecular structure, we'd see that the penicillin actually binds perfectly in this little active site, this little pocket in the enzyme, and, um, and inhibits that, that function. And you can kind of think as, of the small molecule as, as a key that fits perfectly into this lock, this pocket of the, of the enzyme. So with this, with this transpeptidase out of the picture, the cell wall no longer gets made properly. And then, then as the cells try to divide, um, and grow, they actually burst under the, the, the pressure of all the stuff that's building up inside. So the main take home here that I'm trying to convey is that small molecules are really great when you have orthogonal targets. So what I mean by this is that the, the biochemistry of the bacteria is really different from our own cells. So to extend this analogy, you could think of the locks that the bacteria use are totally different from our own locks. So we can eat tons of what is effectively poison to the bacteria, and it doesn't really bother our own cells. But in the case of cancer, it's important to keep in mind that actually all of our cancer cells, they had a healthy ancestor in the past. 
So um, we're, we're using, the cancer cells are using the same locks that the healthy cells use. So if you try to target a cancer cell, like say you find a drug that targets cell division because cancer cells are dividing a lot. Well, you're going to hit that cancer cell, but you're also going to hit healthy cells that are dividing as well. And so this is where this specificity issue comes into play. You get all these so-called off-target effects. So that's one challenge to overcome. I also mentioned the resistance issue. So going with the lock and key analogy, you can think of cancer cells as changing their locks constantly. So there's so much redundancy built into cells that they can actually turn off certain pathways and just stop making stuff that we use as drug targets. So even if you f have this really um, specific drug that kills like 99% of all these cancer cells, that 1% that survives is going to come back. And of course, the drug is going to not do anything in that case. So this is another big challenge that we have to overcome. And I, I have some animations that I've showed you here, but I think that um, it's useful to actually look at the practical outcome of these challenges. So here I'm showing a melanoma patient who's, who participated in a phase one clinical trial for this PLX 4032. And so you can see that the, the patient has several tumors all over his body. And so this is right when he's starting uh, this, this drug. And after 15 weeks, this looks like a miracle, right? He, all these tumors have disappeared. He's gained a ton of weight. Uh, it looks really great, actually. But unfortunately, this is the photo that, that was taken right when he's basically eliminated all of the non-resistant um, cancer cells in his body. And only in a matter of weeks later, basically all of these tumors come back. And unfortunately, this patient died several weeks later after this last photo was taken. Um, and so I think this really drives home the point that um, you can have something that you think works really well, but the, the cancer cells somehow manage to outsmart that. So thinking about these issues of specificity and resistance, how do we actually solve these? And keep in mind, we have to solve both of them simultaneously. So for, for specificity, I think it makes sense to use targeted delivery. So we need, we need molecules or drugs that can actually interrogate the cancer cells and figure out whether or not they are cancer cells or healthy cells um, before they deliver the drug. So, so that's one thing that we need to solve. Another for the resistance is basically the one approach we can take is combination therapy. And so what this means is that we deliver multiple drugs to those cell surfaces um, or to the, to the inside of these cancer cells. And the idea here is that maybe a cell can evolve resistance or find resistance to one drug or maybe even two, but it's probably not going to be able to outrun three or four or five drugs all simultaneously. And of course, we can't just give patients five drugs because they're, they're so toxic and and nonspecific. So basically, we need to solve both of these problems at once. And to me, if you think about this, it's, it seems like we're asking too much of these small molecules. Like, how could we program so much sophistication into like those 41 atoms? Um, so I think that maybe we need to build more sophisticated drugs. And in fact, we need to build larger uh, molecules on the nanoscale that are actually devices that can actually figure out whether or not a cell is the right place to deliver a drug and then deliver multiple drugs only to the, those types of cells. So how do we build these devices? Well, we found that actually DNA is a great um, building material for constructing nanoscale shapes. So, um, so we can program DNA to self-assemble into these nanostructures. And actually, the field was pioneered by Ned Seaman over the last 30 years. And back in 2006, Paul Rodeman actually uh, introduced a really revolutionary advance, um, and he was working at Caltech. And, and he figured out how to make what he called DNA origami, and this is using templated assembly. And I'm going to show you a, a quick animation um, to illustrate how this method works. So basically, what we use is a long single strand of DNA, which we call a scaffold strand, and we, we can make this in the lab, and we know that sequence. And so what we do is we use computer software to Sit, to program or design uh, short st so-called staple strands of DNA that will bind to the scaffold strand and force it um, in a one-pot reaction to, to basically adopt a target shape. 
So um, when I was a postdoc at Harvard, um, I met another postdoc in the church lab named Ido Bachelet. And, and we asked the question, could we actually use this technology to build a device that could target specific cells and actually deliver multiple payloads to those cell surfaces? And so this is a prototype of, of what we built. It's a 35 nanometer uh, diameter barrel. And it's, a, it's able to sequester an antibody payload on the inside. So we can, we can dock a drug. So that could serve as a drug. Um, and basically, it's a DNA origami structure with two domains, a top domain shown in blue, bottom in orange. And the domains are connected in four places. There are two hinges in the back and these two like twist tie locks in the front. And I'll explain how those work in a moment. Um, but first, here's what this looks like under the electron microscope. We can load uh, gold nanoparticles on the inside, or we can load antibody fragments. So these are 20 nanometer scale bars to give you an idea of the size. Um, and the way the targeting mechanism works is it's actually built into what we call a DNA lock. And so the DNA lock is basically a special sequence that, um, that people have figured out how to make, which can actually bind to a ligand or key molecule and actually unzip or separate from its complementary strand. So we thought, could we use this as a building element in making our devices? And um, so here's what this looks like in the unlocked uh, conformation. The, the ligand is bound, and it unzips those, those locks. And then the entire thing swings open like a clamshell and exposes its payload to the surrounding environment, which could be a cell surface. So that's what that looks like. OK, so under the electron microscope, again, we can image this and, and see um, the open versions of the, the what we call a nanorobot. Um, and we wanted to perform a simple uh, selectivity assay to see if this would actually work. So what we did was we mixed together our DNA nanorobots and two cell types. And we loaded as cargo these fluorescent antibodies that could actually bind to both cell surfaces. Um, but then, and, these, and we used this uh, human leukocyte antigen as our target. Um, but then we locked the nanorobots with these locks that could only respond to the keys that are, that are expressed by the NKL cells. And specifically, these are the, uh, this is the PDGF uh, molecule that's, that's made by the NKL cells. So what, what we expect is that, these cell, that, that our nanorobots will be able to um, recognize the NKL cells, open up and bind to the cell surface, but they'll leave these URCAT cells alone since they're not expressing those keys. So we did a simple experiment to test this. Um, we made a locked version of the nanorobot as a negative control. And what you're looking at here is a flow cytometry experiment where we can, we can tell the two cell types apart on the y-axis. So we have those two peaks. Um, and then on the x-axis, we're looking at the fluorescence of the, the antibodies loaded inside the nanorobot. So here's the negative control. It's locked. It doesn't open. So both of those peaks are on the left. If we, un we add an unlocked version, so we just leave it open, it's able to bind to both cell types, so both of those peaks shift. And then, so what would you expect if we had a selective version? Well, what we want to see is that only the bottom peak is shifting. And we were really excited when we actually got this result. So we mix these together, and you can see only the bottom peak is shifting. So, so we're able to actually target those cells in the presence of all these bystander cells which maybe look similar, but they're not expressing those locks. So um, we could actually we could swap out that payload and do a killing assay. So we basically use antibodies that are known to work as uh, to basically push the kill switch on the surface of these cells. And so when they when they bind, they actually induce signaling events in the cells that induce cell death. And so we tested this as well. So we have this control. Um, the control, so basically what we're looking at is a dose response curve where we have increasing concentrations of the nanorobots, and then we're measuring the percentage of cells that we're able to kill. So the control basically stays flat. Um, the unlocked version starts killing the cells at a one nanomolar and higher, and then the gated version also uh, does the same thing once you get to the right concentration. So we published this paper about a year ago, um, so if you're interested to learn more, you can check that out. Um, and I just want to spend one more minute talking about future goals. So one, we obviously want to move in vivo with this stuff. Um, so we want to test these in animals and then later in humans. In order to do that, we, we need mass production. So this is very expensive right now. We need to figure out how to synthesize these things on a mass scale. Um, we are also interested in coming up with new applications for this technology. 
so, uh, this unique uh, positional control that we have at the nanometer scale. And for that, we actually need new talent, new, new students to join the field and work on this. And to that end, when I was at the Wies Institute as a postdoc, I actually, um, they generously gave me some seed money to start a student design competition called Biomod. And so this has been going now for, for two years. We're starting the third year. And uh, so these students all got together and worked over the summer to, to design nanoscale devices. And then they came to Harvard to present their work in the fall. This was 2011. Uh, we had over 150 students last year. And I think this is actually the most important thing that I'm working on because uh, young students are really going to be the ones that solve all these problems and actually implement this stuff in the lab. Um, so, so I'd love to get more people working on this stuff. And with that, I'll just thank all the people who made this possible. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.